everybody. Welcome back to Perfect Pitch Training. Um, welcome back to Perfect Pitch Training. So uh, yesterday we had some homework for the relative pitch training class. I don't think I really figured out how to do that yet. We're just going to continue with Perfect Pitch because today I am eating mac and cheese. So um, I'm eating my dinner late because I just did a teletown hall on police reform. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee gave amazing opening remarks. And, um, you know, yet Samantha Master, of course, Barbara Arnwan, Daryl Jones, um, and Cortland Malloy, uh, Jonathan Smith, Reddit Hudson, a lot of great people. You guys can go check it out. Facebook.com forward slash TDC.DC. Or just look up tjc.dc on Facebook. Go check that out. I mean, of course, after you watch me here or, you know, whatever. Um, so, yeah, let's get into it. So, yesterday, I think I was going over my notes. But because I got food in front of me and I want to finish eating, um, we're just going to go straight into it. Now, I've been telling myself to um, say where we left off. And I think we're just on the next track. That's why I didn't put anything there. I think we're on to, I think we're on to number five. Yeah, because this is Masterclass 4, I have it right here. So I think this is number five. And um, we'll finish going over the notes at the end here. So CD3-4 is done. CD1-2 is done. We get a two-step. Now it's on to the next one. CD5-6. Mama number five. All right. And once again, if I'm interjecting my own comments, I'll count down, and then I'll also count down when I start up the tape again. This is a special live series between uh, Justin and I, so it's perfect pitch trainer. All right, let's do this. All right, I gotta click this, and I gotta click that. First, I gotta click this. Gotta figure out its life. Okay, I hear figuring out its life. Okay. Okay, and I'm getting early this time. Sunny days. Record, so we're going to use this phone, the new LG one, to um, you know, my newest phone to uh, so we won't even have to say hey Google. Oh, I just said it, <laughs> hope it didn't make your phone go crazy. Set an alarm for an hour, cool. If Perfect Pitch is not the association of visual colors to tones, then why do you start with having us relate visual colors with the tones? 
this is just to form an analogy between. That's right. The homework was to. I even drew a crayon here to help me know. It was just such a busy day at work today. We'll do an event tonight and everything, but that's right. We were supposed to be like a kid again and take um uh, a crayon, like a box of 64 crayons, and then just listen to a bunch of music, you know, certain notes and stuff. But we'll we'll still go back to that. Yeah. So. See, I wrote a crayon there. Because we're supposed to take the box of like 64 crayons to be like a kid again and um, just draw whatever color came to mind when we thought of, um, or when we heard that specific note. So, uh, totally forgot about that. <laughs> Um, but we'll probably do that later on this week on a not so crazy day. Okay. Between the visual field and the field of sound. The point is, you're getting your ear to listen for something very abstract. It's nothing concrete. It's just to introduce this concept to the ear. It really doesn't make any difference at all what colors you end up choosing. And the colors your neighbor chooses are going to be completely different, maybe than yours, we're not relating the colors to the tones on a permanent basis. It's just to introduce the concept. And I think it works very, very effectively. Color hearing technique session. As you were listening to the tones, did any of you notice your ear starting to open up? When have you ever sat and listened to individual tones like this? so simply and directly, just sitting, listening to one tone, all your attention focused on one tone. How many of you ever listen like this? Maybe never? I'm sure that many of you found Maybe never. that the more you listen, the better you could start to hear these subtle differences in the tones. And that's how you could finally decide that one tone could be a particular color. You had to choose a color and so in order to choose a color, you had to hear some kind of feeling about that color, some kind of difference about that color, so that you could choose one. And another tone would feel differently. I didn't bring my drink. We're going to find out that development of perfect pitch is really just this simple. It's just a matter of listening in a simple way that we've never really listened before. Just sitting and listening to these tones to discover a subtle aspect to the tones that just passed us by in our day-to-day -day musical activities. And as we continue with our color hearing technique exercises, you'll find your ear cannot help but open more and more and more, just because we're putting some easy and effortless attention in our listening. That's all. Now, if you sneak by and you didn't do this exercise with the crayons or colored pencils or paints or whatever, then okay. be sure to do it later. Okay. This is our hey. introductory drill, which gets your ear thinking and feeling in terms of color. Remember that perfect pitch is a very delicate perception. It's an entirely new way of listening. So this drill is important because it's the official start of your ear's journey towards pitch color perception. So if you miss this drill, be sure to do it later. And I think you'll hear for yourself that it's a more subtle thing than you may have thought. And I think you'll find this exercise well worth it. This brings us to phase one in our color hearing technique practices for perfect pitch. All these masterclasses from here all the way through masterclass 12 these make up phase one of our color hearing technique practice for perfect pitch. This is a preparatory phase where we're going to wake up our ear. We're going to massage our ear to get it to hear more finely. This is absolutely critical if we're going to open our ear to the experience of pitch color. We have to work our ear and it becomes more alive, more sensitive. We wake it up from being so sluggish. This is the main thing for phase one in our training here. We make the ear very alert and open. Then in phase two, this is where the experience of perfect pitch becomes crystallized. 
This is when we actually gain perfect pitch for ourselves. So during this phase one of our training, we're not going to get ahead of ourselves. We're not concerned so much with how well we hear the pitch colors or whether the pitch colors are clear to us or not, or whether we can even identify in the tones at all. We're not concerned about anything at all during this phase one time. All we're doing is preparing the ear to make a smooth transition from its surface style of listening to a deeper perception where we clearly hear the absolute pitch colors. See, there's a certain threshold of sensitivity that we need to cross in order to hear with perfect pitch. It's not so much that perfect pitch comes to you one note at a time. It's not that you start by knowing a C and then later you learn a C sharp and then later you learn a D. It's not really like that. What happens is the ear wakes up gradually and becomes generally more alert. This is what's going to happen in our phase one practices. The ear becomes generally more alert. Then in phase two, we do some different things. And you start to notice that more and more, you're able to identify the tones. All the tones start to become clear at this point in phase two. And they all become clear pretty much at the same time. Sure, maybe you might identify one particular tone more easily at first. Maybe you'll identify the F sharp more easily at first. But basically, all the colors become clear at pretty much the same time. We just have to get the ear to this threshold of hearing. And this takes a certain amount of listening. So we'll prep the ear in phase one. Then we'll crystallize our color experience in phase two. And then when we've developed our perfect pitch, we'll polish it even more with our phase three training. But now, first things first. We have some general points we need to discuss now that apply to all of our exercises for this entire perfect pitch ear training super course. You can take notes if you want, but really, these points are so simple that I think you'll get them as soon as we say them. So you don't even really need to write them down if you don't want to. Why are they so against notes? Here on these CDs and tapes, we're a huge worldwide classroom. We've got musicians listening from all countries around the world. And as a group, we play every possible instrument you can imagine. Piano, synthesizer, guitar, flute, violin, trumpet, clarinet, harp. Many of you are vocalists. We have bagpipe players. Absolutely, every possible instrument. Even drummers are taking this program because they want to hear what's going on in the music and they want to blend better and gain more mastery of their art. So we have all the instruments and we have all the different styles of playing. We have the classical musicians, the rock musicians, the jazz musicians, country, pop, absolutely any style of music you could imagine. And we have the new beginning musicians, people that say, are just picking up a guitar for the first time, just sitting down at the keyboard for the first time. We have amateur musicians, people that have been playing a while, and we have the most seasoned professionals who are playing in world-renowned symphonies and orchestras. We have a number of celebrities that have also taken the program right here. So we have a huge, diverse audience that we have to address in these sessions. Now, we may not all play the same instruments, or all play the same styles, or have the same ability levels, but we do all have ears. This is what we all have in common. We've all got ears. And we want to not only have an ear, we want to have a great ear because the foundation of music is hearing. So it's kind of a challenge to address all of these needs of such a diverse audience like we've got here. But on these CDs and tapes, you have a distinct advantage because after so many years teaching these perfect pitch techniques, we've been able to refine this art of ear training very thoroughly. Over the years, we've talked to countless musicians at seminars, on the telephone, and I've received so many letters, it's just mind boggling. So from experience, we know what works. In fact, 
the tapes or CDs you're now listening to, after so long teaching this program, I think I'm going to call this the final version of the Perfect Pitch Ear Training Super Course. You'll find that this version of the program contains all the subtle knowledge on how to develop your own Perfect Pitch right from scratch. All the techniques are here, right in these master classes. The very same techniques that we found have worked for so many people. You just follow the program step by step. There have been two university studies done on these methods, which do show how quickly the ear opens up to this sense of perfect pitch with these techniques. The conclusions of these studies are really revolutionary because before, so many music teachers were saying, you can't develop the ability of perfect pitch, impossible. Even now, sometimes you hear that you have to have a certain gene in order to have perfect pitch, something in your chromosomes. Well, maybe if you do have a certain gene, then maybe you are more likely to develop perfect pitch as a child, all on your own, spontaneously. Maybe that could be the case. But our experience is, over and over and over, that people who had absolutely no perfect pitch ability have gained perfect pitch as adults. See, we haven't listened before. How can you develop perfect pitch if we haven't sat down to listen? But when you do sit down and direct the ear in this particular direction that we're going to be channeling it all during these master classes, our experience is that people do gain perfect pitch as adults. And the university research also backs this up very clearly. So whatever genes you were born with, whatever genes you have or don't have, we say that any reasonably musically inclined person can also gain perfect pitch, but only when they know how to listen. Otherwise, if you don't know how to listen, then we'd agree that it is very difficult. But when you do know how, and just as importantly, how to go step by step, see, this is very important, how to progress in our training step by step, then you see that something that was unreachable before becomes simplified. We've collected so many stories from people over so many years, and occasionally when it doesn't work for someone, we usually find that it's because they weren't practicing the techniques as instructed, or they really didn't want to take the time to listen. They just wanted it all in a hurry. Now the ear, it can't be rushed all in a hurry. It's a gradual culture. Found that so funny. It's a beautiful refinement that happens. It's delightful. When you start on this quest and you nurture your ear like a child and you begin to listen more carefully, do you really think that your ear would not open up? If you keep listening, you don't think your ear is going to open up? Even a stubborn ear opens up. Mm -hmm. It can't help it. Just like if you lift weights every day, you're going to gain strength. It's natural. So to teach this program, we sat and thought of many different ways to go about it. First, I thought that maybe we'd do a separate program for keyboards, a separate program for guitars, a different course for beginners, another one for advanced musicians, et cetera, et cetera. But the more we thought about it that way, the more we decided to do the program in one large group, as one large master class. Because there's such an artistry to this ear training. It's like if you attend a master class at a music conservatory, you'll find that all the musicians sit together and they listen together. And maybe somebody goes to the piano and plays some Chopin. Now, maybe you're not working on that Chopin piece, and maybe you don't even play the piano at all. But when you listen to the discussion about that piano piece with that Chopin, you gain something, something that you yourself can learn to apply on your instrument, your pieces, your own playing of music. That's the value of a master class. You can observe many diverse situations that you yourself may not encounter for some time, and you learn from that. So we decided it would be valuable for each musician to hear all the subtleties that we're going to discuss. Sometimes we'll say something to the guitarists, but I want the keyboardist to listen to that thing too. And a flute player needs to understand the keyboard techniques because 
a flutist can also use those same keyboard techniques if he or she wants to. So the first thing we should understand as we listen to these master classes is we want to listen to each session all the way through, including the parts that may or may not apply to your own immediate situation. It's a group class. And you never know when we're going to get back to a question that does directly relate to your situation. So we listen to each master class all the way through, and we can take notes on the instructions that apply to us. And we'll have specific techniques that we're going to practice. So you can take notes on those techniques that apply to your situation. You can jot those down. And then when we finish listening to the master class all the way through, then we go and practice those exercises on our own. And when we've mastered those exercises, then, and only then, we listen to the next master class. That is all there is to it. We just go step by step. Easy so far? Now, to begin our color hearing technique practice, we each need a practice instrument. So what instrument should you use? Well, your results will be faster if you use the instrument you play most. Mm -hmm. The instrument that your ear is most familiar with. Okay, so we should check to see when I can go to, um, what's it called? Um, I mean, technically, I guess your voice might be an interest instrument, but this is really about like tones and stuff like that. The one I most do with the guitar, so I wanted to, let's see, when all guitar center repair, um, when is guitar center's repair shops opening? I'm just going to go to the guitar center repair. Okay. Get started now. Repair services we provide. Okay, so it looks like maybe there's one open, but it's like, um, I think it's the one that's, I don't know. We'll look that up later, I guess, because I don't want to take a whole lot of time. I just want to be able to know which one is open. But every time I go to like guitarcenter.com, I find out that like the repair shops like aren't open because of COVID, which obviously, you know, that's good. That's good. They're protecting their employees. You know, like we stand. <laughs> so it sucks that, you know, my guitar needs to be repaired at this moment, that everything just needs to be repaired at this moment. But I think they might finally be open now, at least in my area. Repairs. So yeah, um, the one in Alexandria seems to be open. So I'll call them tomorrow and uh, see what we can do there. All right, that's my plan. That's Bobcat's plan. See, if your ear is always used to a particular sound, like the sound of the guitar, then it's good to use guitar because your ear is already attuned to the sound of the guitar. So your ear will be able to more quickly dive in to the guitar sounds in order to hear these subtle variations in the tones. The process will go faster. So whatever your main instrument is, it's good to use that as our practice instrument of choice when we're doing our perfect pitch ear training. Now, you can do this perfect pitch training on any instrument. It is true. It's just that if you don't use your familiar instrument, it might take a while longer for your ear mm -hmm. to absorb the new sound before you notice any progress. But remember, you can use any instrument. I really think a good practice instrument for anyone is synthesizer because you can adjust the sound of the synthesizer to sort of match your own familiar instrument. Like if you're a flutist, you can set the sound to a flute sound. That's a great way of practicing. 
whatever your instrument, just use the synthesizer sound that most closely matches your instrument. Now, it's not going to absolutely match. We understand that. But whatever's closest. The vocalists, they should generally use the piano or synthesizer. They can use the piano sound. I was hoping he was going to say you can use your voice. Because piano is such a universal instrument, and the vocalists tend to be familiar with that sound. The sound of the piano is already ringing in the vocalist's and ears. And also with acoustic guitars. If you do have a keyboard, a synthesizer, a piano, you'll be able to do more of the drills we're going to discuss because there's chord drills we're going to do. And you can't do chords on a flute. But you can do flute chords on a synthesizer. So if you have a keyboard, that would be great. On the other hand, though, if you don't have a keyboard, you can just learn on your flute, just using one note at a time. That's also fine. Because if flute is your familiar instrument, then your ear will work really well with it. So once you've learned on the flute, you can always go back to a keyboard later and pick up your chord drills. See, like I said, ear training is not a strict science. It's an art. So you'll have to see what works best for you and how you can adapt the instructions to suit your needs. That's why I want you to hear all the instructions in all the master classes, even if you don't think they apply to you at that time, because I think that ear training is a very personalized practice. And I want you to become skilled in the art of ear training with these master classes. So again, we try to use our own familiar instrument or a synthesizer that has that sound of our instrument. If synth is your main instrument, then it's probably good to set it to the piano mode. A piano type sound is, is so universal. I think you're gonna have quicker results with a piano sound than if you use some kind of electronic computerized type of sound. I don't think you wanna use that. That's too unusual for the ear to grapple with at first. Piano is more familiar. Now, once you choose your practice instrument, whatever you're going to use, we don't change the sound. Use that one sound for all your ear training practice with perfect pitch, all the way up until we get to phase three. Relative pitch is a different story. You can use any timbre, any sound of an instrument for relative pitch training. It doesn't matter, but perfect pitch training is different. We want to stick with one sound so that your ear gets used to that sound. It gets settled into that sound so it can dive into the pitch color experience. So stick with your one instrument. Now, as I've said, it's good if you can use a synthesizer or a piano. If you're an instrumentalist, like a sax player, a flute player, or any kind of other instrument, where you can only play one tone at a time, then you can certainly use the piano as well. Anybody can use piano if that's going to work best for you. Just give yourself a little extra time so that your ear can sink in to the sound of that piano. It has to soak in the sound of the piano a little longer before you'll start to notice the results. Just know that, but you can practice on the piano. You, you see how this... Perfect pitch training is not a strict recipe. It's not a strict science. Like a science, we do have techniques that we'll be using, but you'll find it's more an art because you have to have great flexibility as to how you adapt these techniques for your own personal unique situation. I want you to understand the music theory behind perfect pitch. And once you understand the theory, how perfect pitch works, then you'll be able to know what your own ear needs at any particular time, and you'll understand how to adapt any of these techniques to suit your situation. That's why I want everyone to listen to all the instructions for all the instruments. If I say an instruction for the guitarist, remember, then I want the pianist to also listen and understand those instructions. I'm not just speaking to guitarists at that time. All the other musicians can also gain an insight there by understanding what we're working on with the guitarists. So take the instructions you can use, and then you can adapt the instructions as you need to for your own instrument, your own situation. For example, 
We want to do our training in the middle range of the keyboard at first. We want to use about two octaves below middle C and two octaves, maybe two and a half octaves above middle C. We don't want to use these high tones at first. They're just too hard to hear at this point. And these low tones, they're far too dark and muddy. We just stick to a medium range of tones. Now, let's say that your instrument doesn't go down two octaves below middle C. That's fine. Just adapt the exercises to fit your instrument. Understand the principle we're learning and apply it to your situation. And the principle here is, start out using a medium range of tones for your instrument. Don't tax your ear by listening to tones that are at the extreme ranges of your instrument at first here. Now, guitar, on the other hand, has a range of less than four octaves, so there's really no tones that are too low or too high on a guitar. They're all easy to hear. So for our guitarists, you can start off with a medium range at first, and then quickly you can expand your practice sessions to include the full range on your fretboard. There's really no problem hearing tones on the guitar. Now some of the exercises we're going to do are hearing exercises and some are singing exercises. This means that sometimes you'll hear a tone and you'll have to name it. And other times, you'll have a pitch that we're going to ask you to sing. The important thing I want you to always remember is, when you're doing a hearing exercise, you just listen. You just hear. You don't sing the tone. We don't want to start judging pitches with our voice. We don't want to rely on vocal tension pitch in order to identify the tone. We want to learn the pitch by ear. So here's the rule. When you're supposed to listen, listen. And when you're supposed to sing, sing. Easy? Now, we're going to have color hearing technique exercises for all musicians. No one will be left out. But to simplify things, we're going to divide up our practices into three main categories. You don't have to really write this down because it's very simple. Our three categories are solo keyboards, solo guitar, and teams. The solo techniques, these are going to be drills that you can do all by yourself, just using your synthesizer, your piano, your guitar, or whatever your instrument is. These are drills where you don't need a partner you can do them anytime at home. Everyone on this course can do the solo techniques. And we're going to have our solo keyboard group, which means the piano, synthesizer, or any keyboard instrument. And we'll also have our solo guitar group. Our third group is our teams group. Our team practices are for our team players. This means that you team up with someone. We have teams of two, you and one other person. So you can do some additional ear training drills. Your teammate doesn't necessarily have to play the same instrument as you, but you'll have to see about that, see how it works. Team practice is really, really good because you have support there as you're doing your ear training. And there's other advantages because you can switch back and forth drilling each other, and it's a lot of fun to work with someone else. So if you can find a teammate, great. But if you can't find a teammate, don't worry. You can just do the solo techniques. The solo techniques are absolutely complete in themselves. In fact, I myself did it this way when I was 14 years old. I didn't have a partner to work with. Yeah, I had my brothers and sisters, and I would coax them to play tones for me from time to time, and they would. But they wouldn't sit down and help me every day during an ear training session. They weren't about to go that far. So I had to sit down and figure out how to work my ear on my own and open it up. So I'm going to share with you the exact same solo drills that I myself used on my own ear so many years ago. Now remember, if you're only going to do the solo techniques, I'd still like you to listen to all the team instructions. Because team practice is a bit different way of approaching the ear training, and I want you to understand team practice. Then from time to time, maybe you'll find someone to team up with and you'll be able to do some of these techniques. Now for the instrumentalists, the sax players, flutists, 
violinists, brass players, etc. It's good if you can find someone to team up with, or you can practice the ear training meditation techniques that we'll learn. This can be your primary color hearing technique practice. The ear training meditation is so simple, but don't underestimate it. It's an extremely powerful technique in culturing perfect pitch. In fact, all of the techniques that everyone will learn, they're all simple. There's nothing complicated about any of these techniques. In fact, they work because of their simplicity. I find that the ear of the instrumentalists, they're, they're in a completely different category than the other musicians. You know who has a really great ear? It's the violinists, the violists, the cellists. These people have ears that'll knock your socks off. They have to listen very carefully to the tones they're playing. Really, they're creating the pitch for themselves. It's not like they have a fretboard or anything. They have to create the pitch from scratch. An enormous sensitivity is needed to be a string player. So I find that the violinists, all the unfretted string players, they're already so very, very finely cultured in their ears. It's not much for them to go a step further and gain perfect pitch. They're already ripe for it. And to a great extent, the same goes for flutists, sax players, all the instrumentalists. Because when you only listen to one tone at a time, you have a great focus on that line of music that you're playing. Your ear has to zoom in on that line of pitches. It has to zoom in on each tone in a way that is unique. A pianist has so many more tones to listen to and be concerned about. There just isn't as much time to discover a single tone, not in the way the instrumentalists do. Those who play sax, trumpet, clarinet, all these instruments. All these musicians will find that their perfect pitch training moves more quickly. I've seen where all it takes is just the knowledge of pitch color. They just understand what perfect pitch is. You just point out how the tones each have these different qualities. And then the instrumentalist goes to their instrument and just starts to pick up on this experience, sometimes quite rapidly. So the important thing for the instrumentalist is to clearly understand the theory behind perfect pitch and how perfect pitch becomes cultured into the ear. The instrumentalists need to listen to all of the portions of all of our talks. They can play more of a spectator role as we're discussing the other groups, but all of the information applies to the instrumentalists as well, of course. And then as we continue, the instrumentalists find that it starts to happen almost by itself, almost through osmosis, just talking about perfect pitch. And then the instrumentalist, the sax player, they're listening, and as they play, they start to hear the whole thing unfolds, even on its own. And to help the process, the instrumentalist can do this ear training meditation techniques. These techniques we'll be discussing during phase one, and we'll go into even more detail when we get to Masterclass 13. We want to listen to each masterclass one at a time. We never want to do more than one masterclass in a day. Always let yourself stay fresh. Just take one class at a time and go at your own pace. Take as long as you need to practice the exercises, your homework assignment from each masterclass. Don't think that you're going to do it in one day or two days or three days. Maybe in the beginning, you'll be able to do it instantly. The very next day, you can listen to another masterclass. But generally, this is not the case. You're going to be spending many days, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, maybe even three weeks on one particular homework assignment from a master class. We don't rush ourselves. We go at our own pace. At first, actually, they might sound almost childishly simple. But you'll find that as you go, they become a little more tricky. So we want to go step by step. We don't want to get left behind on any step. This is a crucial secret to perfect pitch development, to go step by step. People who rush will never learn perfect pitch because the ear has to progress at its own comfortable rate. 
It's fun. Each drill is like a little puzzle that your ear has to figure out. And you'll be amazed at the clarity that starts to dawn in your ear, even long before you've developed your perfect pitch fully. Now, when you've heard a session, the next day, you don't listen to another session. Instead, you just work on your homework assignment. And we don't practice for a long time each day. Just a short ear training session is all it takes. Actually, your ear will go faster if you just give it a short session, but you do it daily. For our solo practices, we just want to listen for about 10 or 15 minutes. That's all. Don't think you have to go on and on and on. Sometimes when people train their ear too much, then they find they can't hear anything. Has this ever happened to you? It's like you can take a shower for 10 minutes or 30 minutes, but 10 minutes is plenty. So that's the way it is for ear training. We just do a short time for our solo practices, just 10 to 15 minutes daily. And then for our team players, one person can drill the other person for 10 or 15 minutes, and then you can switch. Even 10 minutes per person is fine. So all told, the team players can fit all their training into 20 or 30 minutes daily. That's enough. So we work on our homework drills until we master them thoroughly, and then you progress to the next master class when you feel ready. And if by chance you ever get stuck anywhere in your practice and you don't know what to do about it, then don't worry. We've already thought that through, too. We prepared a special session for you in case you ever need it. This is called the PowerPoints Support Session, which you'll find in your CD or tape collection there. We already know the most common sticking points that people sometimes face. So anytime, if you ever feel stuck, this is your resource. Just listen to the PowerPoint Support Session whenever you need to. But don't listen unless you really get stuck. Leave that session for later in case you need it, okay? So with that, I'll give you now your color hearing technique exercises for today. You can write these down if you want. These drills are so simple that after all this, you may say, come on, this is all you want me to do. Some of you may pass these drills instantly without any practice at all. That's fine. Just pass the drills, and then you can move on to session six. Others of you might take a little time. That's also fine. Go at your own pace. So. For our solo keyboard players, here's your assignment. Just reach out to your keyboard and play any two white tones that are separated by one white tone, like E and G, or F and A, or G and B. We have one tone in the bottom, we skip a tone, and then we have one tone on top. And we play them together like this. We're just using the white tones only. Now, we listen carefully to the sound of these two tones. Listen individually so that you can hear each of the two tones. Usually, we might only hear the top tone. So we have to listen a little more closely to hear the bottom tone. Let your ear get inside to hear the bottom tone as well as the top tone. Now, to prove that you really are hearing these tones, we sing them like this. La, la. We always sing our tones from the bottom up. This is going to be our standard. When you can sing the tones, you have proved that you really have heard both the tones. You didn't just hear the top one. If you can't hear the bottom tone, then play it. Listen to it separately. Then play the two tones together again and see if you can now hear the bottom tone. Just work with your ear like this. Take your time. Work with this drill until you can play any two tones. Just reach out any two tones separated by one white tone. We're just using the white tones right now. And then be able to sing them la, la, just like that. You don't have to name the pitch. You're just singing the tones. We're not naming the tones at this point. You're singing the tones from the bottom up. That's it. That's your assignment for solo keyboards. Now, for our solo guitarists, let me ask you. If I play a string on this guitar, 
That's not the right one. <laughs> if I play a string on this guitar, oh shoot. If I play a string on this guitar, um, oh shoot. I'll do it. If I play a string on this guitar, do you know which one it is? Do you know the D string from the G string? You work with these strings all the time. Do you know each string by ear whenever you hear it? So this is what I want you to do. Just learn the strings on your guitar by ear. Just the six open strings. That's all. Here's how to practice. Without peeking too much, just play a string at random and see if you can tell which one it is. Now, this may be pretty easy for a lot of you, but if we're going to develop perfect pitch, the very first thing I want the guitarist to learn is the strings by ear. These strings are so basic. You have to know them. Now, don't worry and tell me that you're not hearing any pitch colors. Don't worry and say that you're naming the strings by relative pitch. Don't worry and tell me that you automatically know which string it is because there's a pattern to the sound and you already know that pattern. All that is absolutely fine. Just learn your strings, plain and simple. That's all I'd like you to do for that exercise. Learn your strings. Now, if you've had some relative pitch training, then you know how to play major and minor thirds like we're doing here. You can do the same thing on your guitar. A major third means you start here, for example, like on a D string, and you go up four frets, one, two, three, four, until you get to F sharp, and that is a major third. A minor third is just going up three frets to F. So when you have two tones separated by four frets, that's our major third. And when you have two tones separated by three frets, that's your minor third. So you'll be able to do this drill too. Now obviously you're going to have to play one tone on one string and another tone on another string because I want you to hear the tones together. That's the point of this drill. And then sing from the bottom up. You know, you'll get to know a major or minor third just by its sound. <laughs> now on the piano because I'm not a guitarist, as you may notice, just by its sound. You'll see, you'll catch on right away. And you know, if you're really serious about your ear training, it's good for you to learn your major thirds, your minor thirds, and all the other intervals and chords that we cover on the relative pitch course. This will make you strong. Now, for solo instrumentalists, your assignment is even easier. What I'd like you to do is just listen carefully to C and D and sing them very consciously, like a meditation. Here's how we do it. Listen to C on your instrument. Gently hear the tone. Let it soak into your ear. Then hear the pitch in your own mind. Imagine the pitch. Then sing the pitch. La. And then listen to the pitch again. Repeat this with D. We're just using C and D right now. We don't have to worry about any other tones. And we're using the C and D on our own instrument. We're not concerned with concert pitches of C and D. So if you play B flat clarinet, trumpet, your C will sound like a B flat. That's fine. Use C and D regardless of your instrument. Now, the instrumentalists can also use the piano or synthesizer and do the solo keyboard techniques that we were discussing earlier. Or they can get a partner for team practice. These are other things the instrumentalists can do. All musicians, everyone listening right now, can do one or more of the techniques that we have discussed somewhere on this session. For those who want to do the team practice, we're going to begin our teams in our next session. And one last thing I'd like to remind you about this Perfect Pitch Ear Training Super Course. Have fun. Enjoy your ear training. Don't be one of these people who takes everything so seriously and so perfectionistically. Perfect Pitch is not perfectionism. It's just a natural human perception. I think you'll enjoy these drills. They'll challenge your ear. 
they'll definitely open you up. It's thrilling when you hear how your ear is opening. So always remember to enjoy. This goes for all of our musical activities, really, because music is the language of the heart. So we have to remember not to get stuck in our heads. We can approach all our drills in the same childlike way as when we were drawing our colored notes. That's the way to progress. And that's the reason why adults don't usually gain perfect pitch, because you have to have a certain childlike innocence in order for the ear to settle in and open up. Well, we aren't supposed to listen to the next one, he said, until... We've done the homework, but once again, my guitar needs to be taken in. It's uh, quite miserable right now. She says in her 1920s, 30 Southern British accent for no reason. Um, just looking through this for a second. I don't know if the pages are getting stuck in one another. Or maybe it's back here or something. Remember, I took notes on the uh, relative pitch that we had, and they had also given homework. Oh, which I know said we were going to skip. I just wanted to know what it was. But in the meantime, oh, there it is. Homework 20 to 30 minutes. Look at keyboard chart. Um, take each tone, find perfect fifth, and sing. Ah, okay, so that, that was that. So we'll try to do them tomorrow. Because now that I know that you can use musician to learn the piano without even having a piano, which is pretty cool, and I have a musician subscription, I want to do that. Um, yeah. So let me finish going over these notes that I took. Um, see, this is where I found the homework and stuff. That's for the relative pitch training. And I already think went over this, that seven half steps equals a perfect fifth. I think I was on the master class four, trying to go every, over everything there. Um, I just thought of the number four, because he said master class four. I saw a draw on something here, and then it turned into her, who well, I named Sarah, because I always name, like, my drawings of people. I've been doing that since I was a kid, though I could I mean, really draw better when I was a kid. <laughs> but I didn't want to really learn how to draw. Um, I wrote the word listen, once again, in cursive, and then started doodling him. He's really two cursive L's put together, and then it kind of looks like an octopus little guy. I haven't thought of a name for him yet, but he's pretty cool. He talked about how tone deaf um, is a... Uh, is actually nobody's actually tone deaf there's just a, a problem with your vocal pitch um i wrote the word perfect and tried to do it like really cool but it just ended up all smudged once again i was drawing my little guy because i thought he was cute tried to do something here made him so uncute that's a little z i dreamt of it when i was a kid on a skateboard and i thought of a whole book and actually wrote the book called skateboard no lost to the sands of time it was all in a spiral notebook before i was 17. but um so that's what that is i still use it in my signature a lot of a crayon because he mentioned the crayon exercise which we still need to do um chromatic scale so you know 13 colors uh even though the crayon box is supposed to be you know one of the 64 uh crayons that you really wanted to get when you were a kid once again, drawing like little Z's and stuff. Um, and then trying to draw all the symbols, just to, you know, I don't know. Practice that, that get better. Moving on, um, took some notes for work here. Okay, so masterclass number five. So um, I messed up here, and so I just wrote the number five underneath five. 
Uh, so listen to track four for color here in crayon homework. Then um, he said there was a couple basic things to remember. He said they were so simple you really don't need to write them down, but I'm supposed to be taking notes, so I took some notes. Uh, listen to each session all the way through. Practice exercises that or, or practice exercises that apply to you. So still listen to everything, even if it doesn't apply to you, even if it's about a different instrument that you don't play. This is like a worldwide class he prefaced all of this with. So even if you don't think it applies to your situation, you know, still listen to it and then take notes of things that do apply to your situation. That way you can practice what does apply to you. And number two, only then, only after you've listened to a session fully, and then practice the exercise, you know, wrote down and practice the exercise that apply to you. Only then do you listen to the next tape because this is a step-by-step -step process. He's saying you really shouldn't be doing it a whole lot of time, but only taking maybe like 10 or 15 minutes is really all you need. To, and it helps if you practice daily. Um, if you start off on a piano, you're supposed to use the middle range because the other two tones are too, um, uh, you know, too strong, too sharp. Um, here we have, I was just drawing some things. I do believe, you know, when you were a kid and you went to school, y'all remember that? And, uh, I don't know if y'all remember, but there was this game where you had to try to draw these obscure shapes without going over the same line that you'd already drawn. And it was like a huge thing. And so, I, well, this one turned into a flower, but then I started thinking, wasn't this a shape? And so then I started trying to, you know, doodle it. And then, remember there was a money sign one, but I forgot the money sign one or even how it looked. Though, when I was a kid, I could have told you. Anyone could have told you. Um, it talks about for um, a guitar, there is no too low, there is no too high in tones for the guitar. So you'll be able to quickly expand to all the different tones. And so you just you still start in the middle range, though, just like you do on the piano. And then he talks, there's two different exercises here. There's a hearing exercise. And in the hearing exercise, all you do is listen. And then there's a singing exercise. And when it's a singing exercise, you sing. So when it's a listening exercise, listen. Singing exercise, sing. Don't mix the two. Then go over here. He said he was given the um, instructions for the pianist. But in it, he said, we only sing the tones from bottom to top. I'm playing like two tones together to make sure we know both turn tones. I wrote down on the guitar because that's probably the one that I'll be using. Because um, even if that one isn't fixed, at least for the first exercise, I can still use musician. So guitar, you learn strings on guitar by ear. So the homework is to learn the strings on the guitar by ear for the first, for the six open strings. So the six basic strings, which again, I can't even do that. Like that's how jacked my guitar is. I can't even do that. Um, because it's just totally like uh, somebody knocked into it and things like that. And I didn't even realize it right away. But it um, she's pretty rough. Um, and then you play a random, to test yourself on this, you play a random string to test yourself. And um, he also went over a major third and a minor third. A major third is when you go up four frets. And a minor third is when you go up three frets. And you should really, if you really see a symmetry training, you should learn the minor thirds and the major thirds and all of the notes on the guitar. And then you play these things together. And just like with the piano exercise, you try to sing both notes going from the bottom to the top. And um, so that's why I sing from the bottom to the top. And he said for basically the meditation exercise for the instrumentalist, you hear a tone, imagine it and sing it. So you would just hear a tone and then imagine it in your mind and then sing it. And he said you can do any of these exercises, but we're always supposed to stick with one instrument. And so, of course, the instrument we're going to be using, or I'm going to be using, is guitar. There's also team exercises as well, but that doesn't really apply to me. Um, so I'm just probably going to focus on the meditation ones and the guitar ones. So we're only supposed to be listening to, you know, one CD a day. Um... So the way I'm going to try to do these exercises, and you know, you stick with the same instrument too. So even if I was tempted to do both the guitar and the keyboard instruments, I'm only, or exercises, I'm only supposed to be doing the guitar exercise. 
Um, in these few remaining minutes that we have before I do the show description for the radio show tomorrow, which, by the way, you can view at barbaraonline.com. You can also view me being on the radio this past Tuesday because I forgot to say that yesterday. Um, let's continue reading the book because I, I think we might have been supposed to read the whole book. And so, um, maybe. He didn't say, but he kind of covered everything that's on here. Maybe not. Well, I know he covered this, and he covered this, so yeah, so we'll just read these, um, um, in this last couple minutes, since we're supposed to stop and then practice tomorrow and take it a step by step. I mean, but what if your step by step process is rushing? Like, I rush at like everything I do. I just like to go fast. Like, I even talk fast. I do everything fast. Um, like, I do everything fast. Like, really? And so, okay, can I get out of the saxo for a second? And so, like, it's, um, it's, yeah, I just like to do everything fast. So it's like at your own pace. What if you're at your own pace is fast? What if it isn't slow? But I suppose you put those things in there just for specifically for people like me who go slower with stuff. I mean, who go faster with stuff because I like to go fast. Um, I'm a bit tired and I'll probably be a bit tired for the next couple days or so. You know, that time of the month, ladies. And so... um. Uh, so if you see me looking like low energy, you know, just like really low energy, like that's why I, thought, I heard I can drink uh, grapefruit juice because, you know, I have anemia or whatever, which isn't supposed to affect you. But look, being 27, is just like everything just catches up with you. It's a real bore. But anyways, let's get into reading this. <laughs> Though apparently you guys like me just ranting. Or maybe you guys just like the accent. I'm going to try to switch up accents in each part that I read. Okay. So, starting on page 32. Number four. Pitch color and tone color. Tone color, or timbre, is what gives each instrument its special sound. Every piano has a piano timbre. And every guitar has a guitar timbre. Timbre tells you what instrument you're hearing. Each family of instruments has its own timbre, its own distinct flavor, its own tonal color. It's easy to tell a violin from a saxophone, isn't it? Every violin has the stringy tone color of a violin. Timbre makes a tone mellow, rich, thin, stringy, brassy, reedy, hollow, etc. Any such quality that characterizes the sound of an instrument. Within each family of instruments, every individual instrument also has its own unique timbre. For example, a one hundred dial, wow, a one hundred dollar violin will doubtfully possess the rich tone color of a priceless Stradivarius. What gives a tone its tone color or timbre? Timbre is caused by the unique pattern of overtones that occur when a tone is sounded. Overtones are faint tones produced when a basic pitch is sounded. Take a piano, for example. When a string is sounded, it vibrates back and forth, right? But did you know that each string also vibrates in halves, thirds, fourth, ad infinitum? These subtle vibrations cause faint overtones. So when you play C, you're not just playing C, countless overtones are also sounding and you can hear some if you listen closely. Overtones can differ slightly from these exact pitches. They can even occur in between two tones as indicated. First 15 overtones of C and then they give you the little chart here. Try this experiment in any instrument. Using C as a starting point, play the G that is 11 scale tones higher. Listen to this G and give this pitch in your ear. And get this pitch in your ear. Now play your C, but listen instead for the G. Let your ear relax into the sound, and soon you may be surprised to clearly hear. Uh, to clearly hear the G while you play the C. The G is an overtone of C, and remember, it will be much fainter. So we'll continue on this, or at least we'll start tomorrow by reading this chapter and then getting into these, which isn't that long at all, and then getting into these um, 
exercises, which I'll just be using musician for now, because at least I can do it for the purposes of this, because it has the six tones. So I can try to learn those by ear, you know, and um, put it up to the camera, that kind of stuff, so I can't see it and practice that away for now until I can get my guitar fixed. Hopefully, maybe this weekend. Um, because it looks like a guitar center in Virginia might be open. The repair shop, that is. So hopefully that's what I'm able to do. And he didn't say anything about using a little djembe drum. So even though it's got uh, supposed to have all the tones of a piano, I don't think I can use it. It's still a cool outro, though. Oops. Really does not like loud noises. The microphone, I mean. Anyways, I gotta go write a show description. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Once again, um, you can view the show description that I'm writing at barbaraonline.com. Um, you can also view the uh, event that I did earlier. Well, I didn't do it, but you know, I was behind the scenes doing it, where I like to be. Um, at uh, at facebook.com forward slash tjc.dc. I gotta put it on photorightsalliance.org as well. But those just a lot of technical problems. Anyways, thank you guys so much for joining. And um, don't forget to like and subscribe if you're not already, if you like what you see. And um, yeah, see you all tomorrow. Bati out. I was not looking at the camera that whole time. I'm so sorry. <laughs>